We're back to VMworld Live 2010, Silicon Angles, continuous coverage of VMworld in the Cube with a very special guest, Ed Bunyan, who's the CTO of the business unit within Cisco. But he's known in the industry circles as uh, somewhat a legend, as an early co-founder of VMware. So welcome, welcome to the broadcast. So, so I have a couple, first couple questions. Like, how does it feel to look at VMware growing up like this? I mean, does it get a little bit of weirdness to you? Is it? Uh, no, it's not weird, but it's amazing. Uh, it certainly is, is getting bigger and bigger every day and every year. Uh, I remember the first VMworld, we thought 14, 1,500 people was a lot. Uh, I heard the whisper this morning was 17,000, so I don't know if it's true or not, but it certainly feels like a packed house. Virtualization is certainly center stage right now in the cloud. Uh, would you have predicted it would be this relevant this fast from when VMware started, or yes, or is it in the, did it take the shape that you had thought it might? Well, I mean, you know, the if you go back to the early, early, early principles of, of VMware, it was all about isolation and encapsulation, and it was all about mobility. And if you go back to the early, the late '90s, right, mobility meant you can take a VM and you could basically, you know, copy it uh, uh, as a file from a, a computer to another computer. These were desktop operational models at the time. Uh, so the elements w that are still foundational to the cloud today or w were present uh, over a decade ago. What's changed in the meantime is we've gone from desktops to uh, data center and service scale virtualization. And then the other thing obviously is the, the networks and uh, have evolved to the point that you can now think of computing in the cloud, which, which is not something that was being thought about in those terms uh, a decade ago. Great. I'd like to introduce my co-host for this session is Stu Miniman, the senior analyst at Wikibon, who Recently is now uh, an analyst, but was at EMC and knows Ed, and you guys are gonna talk uh, a little bit. So Stu, I'm gonna pass it over to you for, uh, and I'll jump in if I have any questions, but go ahead. Thanks, John, yeah, and I, I went my 10 years at EMC, <laughs> uh, I, I met with Ed back uh, in the Diane Green days, uh, part of the acquisition, and uh, you know reconnected with Ed uh, when he was the CTO of the Nuova uh, group with Cisco, and uh, obviously he worked a lot with Ed on the, the fiber channel over Ethernet, and his UCS has been launched out, so great to see you, Ed. Uh, and thanks Good for joining us. As well, Steve. Great. So uh, I went to Howie Ju's session this morning talking about uh, networking, and one of the comments uh, Howie made is, you know, when you look at you know VMware and server virtualization, you know. A couple of years ago, you wouldn't have had networking people showing up here. And now, there, there's a good contingency of networking people showing up here. Obviously, Cisco's well re represented. Um, I, I'm wondering if maybe you could uh, uh, talk for a minute about uh, kind of the Cisco and VMware innovation that we see going on right now. Yeah, so I, th I think this is a this is an absolutely correct statement. In back in the early days, virtualization was was really a, a single disciplinary um, solution, right? It was sold and operated by server administrators, very often departmentally, um, and without really having to worry about network policies, without having to worry about storage policies for that matter, and without having to worry about uh, issues of compliance and security and audibility and reproducibility because it was used as a tool rather than as a core infrastructure. And the transition is now uh, vSphere is really viewed as a core infrastructure of the data center. It's part of, it is the fabric of the data center at the software layer. And the interaction between uh, the distributed system that is vSphere and the underlying network becomes that much more important. So the thing that we introduced um, two years ago that sort of put Cisco on the map into the VMworld community was obviously the Nexus 1000V, which basically is a, is a pretty simple observation, which is, Virtualization, and it was, could, if it's not thought through carefully, can introduce operational gaps or blind spots. Uh, you get efficiencies as far as one set of deliverables of the IT organization is concerned, but you create blind spots or issues to other groups, and in this case, uh, the networking team. And it's really important when you think about, when you, when you, you think about the problem from a networking angle, and I've been now at Cisco for uh, between the Nuova days and the Cisco days working in this industry for the past five years is it's really about the end-to-end -end visibility across a common set of tools, a common set of methodologies. And so the Nexus 1000V is, is, is the bridge because it's the tool that allows you to have a network, classic network methodology, extend the topology of the network into the virtual infrastructure while at the same time fundamentally not changing anything as far as server administration is concerned, as far as VMware Virtual Center is concerned. So, so yes, uh, lots of people from uh, uh, from with a networking background, 
um, at VMworld, lots of people from Cisco, not necessarily all networking people, right, because we're much more than a networking company, uh, but we have a north of, of 200 uh, employees at this show, one way or another, um, and certainly because of, because virtualization is the center of, of the, the thinking uh, and the brainstorming from, uh, from all of the organizations that, that constitute a data center, uh, and obviously not to mention the cloud. Okay, so and, and obviously when you talk about these cross-disciplinary uh, solutions, uh, obviously Cisco's UCS is playing right into that marketplace. Um, I, I wonder, you know, where specifically do you see UCS um, in the virtualization marketplace? W what, what's next? I mean, we talk about kind of scale-up, scale-out architectures and, and cloud architectures. Uh, you know, how is UCS going to tackle, I guess, the, the two biggest challenges I hear from the community are management and security. So... Uh, a a any any comments on the direction there? It, yeah, and, and by the way, management and security are, are related. The more complex the management, the more difficult it is to reason about the security of it. Uh, the more manual the provisioning of the infrastructure, the more difficult it is to reason about its security. So UCS is really, um, I at the end of the day, was a relatively, um, in retrospect, straightforward observation, which is um, that there were si significant advantages of going from a box-centric view of thinking about x86 computing in the data center, mm -hmm. uh, which is the classic systems management approach to things, where basically, at the end of the day, a server companies sell chassis with a few blades in them, uh, and then the customers have to operate them by having these different points of configuration you know, that are independently managed for the same entity in the same box. And the observation we made is, let's just flip this over uh, in its head, and rather than selling uh, a chassis, is to sell a fabric in which you can plug chassis into it uh, and wi with a single point of management. Um, and and the one of the things that, that I think resonates the most uh, by customers who use UCS is the fact that you can really now have this, this dual view of your, of your infrastructure. On one hand, UCS as a system is something that gets laid out on a, on a few racks, right? It can scale way beyond the size of a single rack. So think about four racks worth of gear with the network inside. And that's sort of the physical view and all what we assume and, and understand about the physical lifecycle management of things. But at the same time, UCS is also, from an operational perspective, simply a, a, a web service, a single web server uh, that exports a, a RESTful, RESTful style XML API as a single point of provisioning and control for that entire kit. And it's really the reduction in the number of points of management that is enabled by the, uh, the raising of the abstractions that we export from the system itself that it is, um, is making you know, UCS sort of a, a differentiated offering uh, in the marketplace. And at the end of the day, the, 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 the pain points that customers have is it still takes too long to cable and provision physical gear. And once you have it cabled and wired up, it still takes too long to configure it physically before you can even get to the vSphere layer. And then also you end up having an infrastructure where it's very difficult to adjust your network policies and your server policies because those tend to be managed separately. In UCS, you have the ability to atomically repurpose capacity and really turn the data center into a set of fungible resources at the hardware level. Right, so, so uh, a absolutely, I, I like how the, you know, there, there's some argument uh, between especially some of the, the guys that really are helping customers deploy the solution. Because if you look traditionally, the VAR has done the job of taking all the pieces together, integrating it together, building it for you know, scalability, performance, whatever we need. And of course, UCS is built, and especially if you start talking about like a V block, we put all the configuration together, and some would say it's too fixed. But rather than having all of the knobs, we, we have something that can be deployed a, lo a lot simpler. Um, one of the things, uh, when you say, you know, this is the configuration and this is what you get, but when you talk about roadmap, uh, one of the questions that I've gotten from the Wikibon community and the practitioners is, you know, uh, what where other technologies, are there going to be some flexibility down the road? For example, you know, will there be an AMD option uh, on UCS? Okay, so I think I think we got to separate a couple because there are different sort of questions layered into into the in, into the, the, the the set of questions. Fair enough. Um, first is UCS itself is a product with a very strong roadmap, um, including elements that are public, uh, and that we're talking about, and including and elements that are obviously under NDA at this point. Uh, but fundamentally, the way to think about uh, where th 
the way we think about the way we are thinking about UCS from a roadmap perspective. It's really about um, further automating and further increasing the scale of the systems under management, but with you know, while keeping sort of a certain set of architectural principles uh, as we've laid them as we introduce UCS because those have been uh, extremely effective and those architectural principles is is the unified fabric, uh, you know, the center point around Ethernet as the underlying uh, link technology, uh, transition from 10 into the next level of standardized link speeds, starting with 40 gig Ethernet, which is actually not far away, and then building bigger and bigger systems with, with richer fabrics inside. Um, now, UCS itself is, uh, is an architecture, um, but it's not a prescriptive deployment model that you can have different size and shapes and ratios of, of UCS. There's lots of choice with respect to the blades and the compute factor, form factors. There's a lot of choice with respect to the adapter form factors. Um, and then there's a lot of choices and options with respect to the topologies and the ratios and the oversubscriptions levels that you have in your management model. Uh, the V-Block uh, is, V-Block is something different. Mm -hmm. The V-Block is really designed to take a lot of the guesswork out of the deployment in an enterprise environment of a system that has uh, a UCS compute backbone, right, as far as the computing side is, is concerned, uh, combined with enterprise grade storage, which is either the VMAX line or the Clarion line, with all of the associated enterprise storage capabilities that, you, that are come with the product. And a V-Block is a more, more prescriptive, um, lay down of the combination of those two pillars uh, with a very clear value proposition is that it takes out a lot of the guesswork as you're deploying virtualization at scale. And I think if you think about where the state of the art is today, it's relatively straightforward to deploy vSphere in a small scale. And I think VARs will say that and end user customers obviously will say that as well. Where things become more challenging is as you scale your deployment, as you make them more multi-tenant, as you want to turn them into a service as opposed to something that you consume internally, whether it is your private cloud or your online cloud. And that's some of the challenges that the vBlock is designed to address. And certainly with respect to how VARs think of this, um, I, they very much welcome the value add, the, uh, the reference design, and the fact that the three companies stand behind the solution itself. Sure. Um, the issue of, of support and the complexity of support as we deploy these high-end sophisticated solutions is always something that's front and center in the customer's mind. It's not something that the VAR can, can directly address. Right. And it actually, if anything, allows the VAR to focus on some of the more, much more uh, value-added elements of the conversation, including how you can take advantage of that new scalable architecture. Okay, great. Excellent stuff, Ed. Um, yeah, I, I guess, you know, uh, trying to think of any uh, kind of follow-up. When I th think about in, in the networking spaces, one of the challenges we see is that uh, when, when you look at the, the next generation speed, you know, 40 and 100 gig ethernet, there, there's only a small number of customers that are uh, really requiring that bandwidth and driving that, um, you know, I, you know it's, it's, it's if you look at you know the Facebooks and the Googles need that bandwidth, need to drive it further, and uh, you know you, you wonder how many customers um, you know don't need that technology and are kind of pulled along um, behind it. So uh, just uh, was curious your thoughts on kind of macro trends in the networking space. You know what, what would what would be the biggest challenge you see uh, over the next three to five years? Well, so all of us uh, who started in the industry um, after Bill Gates have learned never to say that you would never need more than X, right? Sure because unfortunately it gets held against you decades later. So yeah, of course one day we'll need 40 gig and 100 gig. Um, I think that the, these new levels of speeds are associated with the fact that the data center is going to be truly managed as a system. When, when VMware talks about the software mainframe, the distributed mainframe, it is yep. premised on the existence of a high performance uh, compute fabric. Um, the, the analogy I would use is, is with respect to multi-core. Right, you could have made a sort of a few years ago the same argument, uh, how would you possibly need more than one or two cores per CPU? Well, the reality is now you've got eight and 10 cores per CPU as a standard building block of your offering, and that there are ways to take advantage of them, namely virtualization. So uh, I'm very confident, confident that the industry will find ways to take advantage of those new capabilities, and we are actually already seeing some demand for bo both um, four times 10 gig solutions, 
uh, because in some cases the bandwidth for certain types of capabilities is actually the limiting element. Uh, and also for um, a lower latency solution where you actually take advantage of the 40 gig uh, all the way down to servers. It's still part of the roadmap, but um, the one thing that the industry has done uh, and certainly is preparing to do this time more smoothly than in the previous transition is to enable a faster adoption of the new technologies. We went from one to 10. That has proven to be complex and complicated because yeah. of lots of PHY issues and transmission issues. Yep. Uh, the transition from 10 to 40 is gonna be a lot smoother. Okay, great. Um, I think, Ed, appreciate you coming on theCUBE and uh, talking about, uh, are there any uh, sessions coming up at VMworld that we should be especially paying attention yeah, to? Yeah, actually, thanks for bringing it up, Stu. Uh, so, uh, I will be speaking tomorrow at uh, 11 o'clock, uh, right after uh, the keynote from VMware. Uh, this is the super session. And the big, uh, the theme of the super session is uh, the delivery of uh, scalable cloud services. So we're really moving from, if you think about what we what we did in, in 2008, it was about uh, operational gaps, it was about network awareness for virtualization right. and, and the Nexus 1000V. I, in 2009, it was about UCS and, and how you can take UCS to solve compute problems at a data center scale. Uh, this year, it's about scalable cloud services and how you can start thinking about the network and the services that are part of the network uh, on a cloud scale for cloud deployment. So I hope to see some of you uh, at the show. Great. Okay. Well, thanks so much, Ed, for coming on. We're going to take a break. We'll be right back with the uh, Rob Roy, CEO of Switch Networks, and uh, Charlotte Yarkany, who is with EMC running the public cloud of EMC to talk about what that means. And uh, we'll be right back for Silicon Angle's continuous coverage of VMworld 2010 Live here in theCUBE. Ed, thanks so much. Stu, thank you, John. Appreciate it.